Hello and welcome to the India Hangout. We have a problem. India is generating about 12 or rather it needs about 12 million new jobs every year. They that about 40,000 new people coming into the workforce. The question is where are the jobs? Subir Gokan of, uh, of the Brookings Institution India and formerly Deputy Governor of the Reserve Bank has written an article uh, this morning in the newspaper which asks uh, quite uh, star uh, starting, startlingly uh, and says that the majority of India's workforce will actually be obsolete before it even starts working and that's quite frightening. So I'm joined by both uh, Subir Gokaran as well as uh, the National Skills Development Corporation Managing Director Dilip Chenoy uh, to get a sense on A, how bad is the jobs problem in India, what could it do and finally what are the solutions not just specifically and empirically but also from a policy standpoint. So before I come to uh, Dilip in a moment and take some of the questions that are beginning to come in, uh, Subir why don't you give us a sense, how bad is the problem of uh, job creation? and meeting the needs of these this workforce which is ever ever uh, or rather labor force which is burgeoning yeah so i want to start by providing some perspective which i i hope uh, you know people read my article in the business standard uh, of this morning but i think it's important to have uh, some perspective on the numbers and the number that we are very familiar with is, uh, you know, uh, 1 million entrants into the workforce every month, 12 million jobs a year needed, or if you want to round it off, 10 million. So that's all very fine. But let's not forget that our record uh, in terms of uh, job creation has been very, very uh, inadequate. Uh, more than 50% of our workforce is still primarily dependent on agriculture, even though agriculture has shrunk to less than 15% of our GDP. Uh, of the people who go out of agriculture, uh, close to 60%, and there's some more recent numbers out, so maybe that pattern uh, will change, but, but close to 60% are in either uh, self-employed positions, which is not, you know, uh, people like you, Govind, but uh, the average person selling uh, stuff off a street cart uh, you know, cigarettes, pan, uh, fruits, whatever. Uh, and another uh, close to 20% are, uh, are uh, in the informal sector. So this is a huge uh, you know, barrier in terms of people moving out of uh, relatively low productivity jobs into what we might consider desirable jobs, uh, relatively organized with protections, rights, and so on, uh, and with upward mobility, with the prospect of uh, increasing their income as they go along. This is how countries develop. This is how countries Right. So, uh, Dilip, let me come to you. Uh, you know, you're, I mean, you're part of an effort that's obviously trying to address the problem of uh, jobs and skills uh, and thus uh, job creation. Uh, how do you see the scale of the problem and to what extent can the efforts that are being put in on uh, the supply side resolve this in the near future? Actually, uh, three issues. I could not hear much of what uh, Subir said because our audio was not coming through to me. Three types of issues, I think, uh, two of which Subir uh, has actually referred to very, very uh, clearly. One is the number of jobs uh, that will be generated over the next few years in relation to the number of people entering the workforce. The second is the changing nature of the job roles uh, that are there and the ability for people who are trained in today's skills to be able to meet uh, tomorrow's uh, requirements. And I think third, most importantly, uh, I think uh, uh, overlooked is the whole productivity of the workforce. The NSDC efforts are really on, uh, on three fronts, but in the first one in creation of jobs, we are not actually in a power in, or in a, in, a, in a possible position to create jobs in the economy because that is a function of economic policy and other things that uh, are beyond the scope of NSDC. What we are trying to do is to equip people with entrepreneurial skills, with livelihood skills, uh, so that uh, in, in the rural setting and the semi-urban and even in some cases the urban setting, uh, people can take recourse to entrepreneurship and livelihood measures uh, to be able to earn livelihood and create uh, and add to the job pool. So that's one 
you know, for example, working with self-help groups who could sell products or make products and sell products, right. or artisans who could be linked to selling organizations, etc. In the case of uh, skilling, uh, what we are uh, what we are trying to do when we have a target. Uh, last year we were given a target of about one million people. This year. I think that the target may may more than double to 2.5 or 3 million. Uh, we are just awaiting the numbers, but internally we are targeting around 3 million plus uh, people this year. And what we are trying to do, there is a regular uh, need to skill people for jobs in industry, and second, the need to upskill people who are working within industry. For example, uh, in, in some cases, an old lathe machine is being uh, upgraded to a CNC machine. The old lathe operator has to be trained on a CNC machine because if he doesn't get skilled on the CNC machine, he will lose his job and will not be fit to work uh, in, in the right. in company. Or similarly, if you take another uh, sector, if you take uh, even in IT, many of the people who used to work in a particular function in a call center a function has been replaced by uh, international, you know, an IVR system. The jobs have become redundant. How do you retrain them and reskill them for other uh, positions? So this is the second uh, kind of activity uh, that we are uh, doing. The third is in terms of productivity. How do you ensure that people who are getting skilled uh, are being skilled to international standards, to international levels of productivity? We are collaborating with uh, sector skill councils, let's say in Australia, UK, and Germany, to get a sense of their competency standards and their standards to ensure that the training uh, that is done in India uh, meets right. their standards so that we are globally competitive. Right. Got that, uh, Dilip. Uh, let me come back to Subir. Subir, so you made a couple of points, right? Uh, so one is that uh, you're talking about almost a billion people in the workforce uh, by 2030. Right, so, and, and that's a really large number. On the other hand, you're also pointing out that uh, there is uh, the march of technology. By definition, the march of technology leads to more uh, cutback in labor. And of course, there's offshoring. I mean, offshoring could happen within the country. It could happen from country to country and so on. So all the other forces that could potentially uh, create jobs or help the creation or absorb jobs seem to be against uh, uh, this, uh, uh, you know, sort of uh, mitigating the problem as it were. So, what's the way forward then? To recognize that uh, you know, these forces are, uh, are upon us. They're, they're, they are shaping the global uh, market, they're shaping the global production environment, they're shaping everything uh, that influences uh, our ability to, to put more people to work in the kinds of jobs that we would like them to be in. I think uh, the NSDC is a very important part of the solution, and I, I think that you know it's, it's a great initiative. Uh, I, I hope they scale up uh, to the levels that they, they aspire to. But that's only one part of the solution. Uh, the main thing is that because of uh, offshoring, and I'll, I'll specifically refer to the offshoring threat, that we can only generate jobs onshore if we become the lowest cost uh, production center. Uh, which means that we have to be putting everything into play, which ensures that our producers, whoever they are, whether they're domestic or foreign, uh, find India a place to uh, locate because, their cost, uh, if because of cost efficiency. And that means uh, having uh, workers that are uh, both relatively low cost, which is something we can certainly do, but also relatively productive, which is, I think, where our challenge is. The training comes in there. But it's a lot of other things also. There's infrastructure relating to transportation and so on. Uh, there are tax issues, uh, movement of goods across state borders, a whole bunch of other enabling factors that I think they have to get into place. And I think the, the, the point I'm trying to make is that uh, an employment strategy is not just about uh, providing skills and creating jobs. It's also about creating the larger macro and institutional ecosystem. Uh, which enables us to become efficient producers. That's how jobs are going to be created. 
we cannot uh, resist or cannot stop the march of technology. But to the extent that labor still is an attractive option or labor intensive activity is still an attractive option, we have to be sure that we are competitively placed to take full advantage of it. The second point I want to make is that people become, the skills become obsolete very quickly now. Uh, three years, five years max, you know, the technology has moved on. A person who was trained in one particular technique uh, is obsolete uh, five years down the road. So we have to also build in, and I thought I heard Philip say that uh, the NSC is also looking at mid-career and you know, periodic uh, skill upgradation. I think that's going to be very, very critical if we are going to survive, if we are going to sustain the kind of job growth momentum that we need to, uh, not just training people out of school and then putting them in the workforce and forgetting about them, but also providing formal uh, training which allows the skill upgradation. That requires financing, that requires a bunch of other institutional changes which I think I have to start thinking about very seriously now. Dilip, uh, you know, uh, one of the points that, uh, uh, okay, let, let me throw a couple of questions that have come in. You know, so first is, uh, can we put the entire blame or the, on the government or the system? Has private sector and industry done its bit? 40,000 jobs a day cannot just be going to the government, asked Shruti. Dilip, did you uh, hear that question? Question is for me? Yeah, the question is for you. Yeah, this is about has private sector or... And industry uh, done industry its bit, yeah. Bit for creating jobs. Yes. Yeah, you know, I think this is a, uh, this is a very... Um, it, 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 it's a question which uh, actually has a very long and uh, difficult answer, but, <laughs> I, but... You know, if the economy is not growing, Right. Yeah. I mean, if you take the auto sector, if we're having uh, you know inflation driving up the cost of petrol, high interest rates, nobody buying new cars because of uh, conditions external to the industry, how can you blame the auto industry for not uh, you know for not creating jobs? So it's it's you know I think the whole and and uh, uh, the bits of pieces that I could hear Subir actually talking, which he said that you need to look at the whole ecosystem. In the in the given ecosystem, the rate of creation of jobs by the private sector is perhaps not bad, right? Right. It could be better. Yes, it could be better, but it cannot be done by industry alone in isolation of the economic environment within the country. And if incentive is to protect existing jobs and not create new jobs, then it actually throws things further out of gear. And the other aspect is that I think the data relating to job creation uh, needs to be re-looked at because you know if 83% of the jobs in the economy and the informal sector, and we are missing a lot of the numbers that of jobs that have been created. So it's 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 uh, can the private sector do more? Um, Given circumstances, economic uh, situation changes, I'm sure the right. job creation scene will also change. Right. So, uh, uh, the one reason we are having this discussion now, Dilip, uh, and of course this has had, I mean, on, and, and there are many occasions when these, this discussion can be had, is that uh, we are obviously looking uh, uh, at a new government coming in and the, the urgency for a huge policy kick uh, is perhaps, uh, has never been felt so much. Uh, or to this extent, so what is the what is the way what what do we need to do to uh, both on the demand side and the supply side in order to now accelerate uh, either the creation or the absorption process when it comes to new jobs? I think uh, Subi is more qualified to actually address <laughs> that yeah. question. Uh, I you know. I don't know. I think Subir, would you like to uh, step in and really uh, talk about job creation here? Subir, repeat that. I'm, I'm having a little trouble with the audio. You you said something about what the. the Okay, so we're, I think uh, we're having a slight problem uh, with uh, Subir's line. We'll get him back in a second, uh, Dilip. So let me come back to the, uh, there's another question here. Is the NSDC equipped to manage skilling and reskilling 40,000 people a day? Uh, 
<clears throat> if you are talking about the NSDC uh, yeah. man, uh, being equipped to uh, scale 40,000 people a day as of today, the answer is clearly no. Are we, uh, but the question is, are we creating an ecosystem to ensure that at least 45,000 people a day would be skilled sometime going forward uh, in the next uh, two years? The answer is yes. You know, we must understand that skilling and education is an exponential growth kind of a system. Uh, you know, you can't build scale overnight. Right. And second is that the traditional way of skilling where you have, you know, square feet and boards and, you know, one teacher for 20 students uh, is kind of getting outdated because we need to use technology and we need to use technology to how do we take the best teacher to a million students? How do we uh, use simulation uh, in uh, reducing the cost of training? I think NSDC is actually creating an ecosystem to do that. Just to give you an example of the type of scale that we are talking about, two years ago, uh, we trained 120 or 180,000 people, 180,000 people. Last year, it was 400,000 people. I mean, the year, year after that, last year, it was uh, uh, 10.9 lakh people. And this year, we're looking at 30 lakh plus people and the year 1 after million that, to 3 million yeah hmm. yeah 3 million so that's the way type of exponential growth that you would have uh, going forward and uh, we are fairly confident that the target of uh, 150 million by 2022 would be achieved uh, i think uh, subhi's article today talks about uh, 2030 uh, you know slightly longer time frame and by that time, we should have a stable ecosystem. The next four to five years, we should have a stable ecosystem in the NSDC framework to ensure that numbers that we are talking of are actually catered for. Right. So, what, what are the, from your experience, uh, uh, Dilip, what are the issues on the demand side? I mean, I think, so you, you've laid out the path and the, as you've done before in the past as well, the path on the supply side, right? How you will uh, capture uh, the, uh, the workforce in terms of skilling them or reskilling them pumping them back into the into the system but what's it looking on the other side from from the demand side from the job side i think the first issue is that the areas of growth that we are seeing are limited to very very few sectors if you look at the star scheme that we're running as an indicator of the areas of growth it is retail it is uh, it is banking uh, services it's fibers right and the manufacturing side has not yet uh, taken off. But we can sense the underlying kind of, uh, uh, you know, energy being built up there so that when GDP rebounds, I think there will be a stronger uh, growth for that. The second is that time and again, we are finding what uh, the education uh, uh, sector believes is correct is not necessarily the same as that which is uh, being perceived by the employer. I mean, just a few weeks back, I think uh, we hosted a, a presentation by the McKinsey on the employment survey that they had done. Yeah. And very interestingly, in that, it said that you know 83% of the education establishments felt that they were doing a good job. Less than 50% of the employers agreed with them. So what we are trying to do here is actually to bridge the world of education, the world of employment, getting employers to actually set standards, which the education institutions could then use as a tool for you know, aligning some of their courses so that when the people come out from the education establishment, they don't, they're not only educated, but they're also prepared for the world of uh, work and the third thing which is which is again critical going forward is kind of have to anticipate technology changes and you know start training people if a person joins the engineering course right now after he passes out of four years so someone has to be predictive about what would be something you know required four years hence or three years hence 
how do you prepare pe uh, people to adapt to that and how do you in, you know uh, make them learn because what they're teaching the energy sector today may well the requirements of the energy sector may change tomorrow so that's the three things that we're looking at from the uh, demand side and we've set up these 29 sector councils which are uh, led by industry and the employers to actually advise us and guide us on how uh, the future would look uh, two to three years from now as well as you know, how do we plan for next year Right. Uh, so, Dilip, here's the other question. Now, uh, you know, when I mean, when you talk about jobs, I mean, you've given the numerical, uh, maybe the verticals. Uh, how does it look uh, horizontally and geographically? I mean, where is uh, where is most of the skilling uh, happening? What is the kind of uh, uh, demographic uh, spread and width, if they were? We we are just in the process of uh, completing a district-wise uh, state-level skill gap survey across different districts. Mm -hmm. Again, if I were to look at uh, if I were to look at the STAR uh, program, what we are finding is a lot of uh, inputs uh, from Bihar, uh, eastern I mean uh, some parts of uh, Uttar Pradesh, uh, where people are uh, very keen to learn. Uh, skill and there are some very interesting uh, migratory trends. You know, gems and jewelry is is picking up in in parts of Odisha and West Bengal. You find that these people actually go to places like Gujarat, Bombay, and Delhi uh, to work. Hospitality is also there. Of course, the classic place of plumbing in Odisha. So we are finding two, two, three different types of things uh, in terms of spatial. Uh, you know things that there are some centers which are the employment centers and there are some centers which are providing for the migratory uh, kind of workforce uh, that goes and works there and there are very very specific migration trends uh, from these people so that's something which we are trying to actually uh, capture there in the northeast we find that there are less jobs and more people there's kind of a deficit of about 10 to 12 million people uh, uh, for people jobs in, in, the, in the future. So, uh, again, in JNK, there is no economic activity, so a lot of the jobs will necessarily be outside uh, the state. The southern states uh, have uh, shortages in, in, in some uh, areas of employment. There's a mismatch between high job uh, you know, growth areas. In many states, construction is a high growth area, but the aspiration to work in the construction industry is very low. Right. You know, so we find a mismatch in terms of aspiration, and we also find a mismatch in terms of the availability of jobs and the number of people that need to be employed. Right. So, uh, how is the next year looking, uh, uh, Dilip? If very broadly, if one were to uh, look at the targets, you said three million is something that you're closing in on now. Uh, is there sufficient momentum in the skilling side <coughs> to keep it going? Assuming that, of course, we've all, uh, I mean, rather having seen that economic growth has not been strong enough to absorb uh, the, all your efforts. Yeah, so, you know, like I said in the beginning, we are not only focusing, you know, most uh, programs tend to focus on you train a person for a job, you get him employed in the organized sector, and that is known as placement. We're looking at different models. We're also looking at, you know, some of our models are, uh, for example, a caravan or industry are training people in certain crafts and they're giving design led inputs for those people to, you know, uh, make those crafts or those products and right. sell them. Now, so there's a lot of entrepreneurship. There's like Mandeshi Foundation and HSBC in, in, in Satara uh, are looking at women uh, into creating, making them entrepreneurs and getting them to do jobs. Similarly, uh, you know, we have uh, Madura Microfinance or Sayog Microfinance. Uh, we have different models across uh, the country. Entrepreneurship and self-employment is, is a key aspect of that. Now, you know, we typically track uh, month by month. You know, it's, it's somewhat like the IPL uh, kind of the worm that you have. We have the worm of last year, how many did in April last year, and how many we expect to do in April this year. 
and numbers that we are seeing that we have actually done a little more than three and a half times this April than we did last year. The same trend continues, right? We should be able to actually, uh, you know, uh, meet the, the, the target that has been set uh, by ourselves currently. And if, uh, you know, the economy were to improve uh, in the third or fourth quarter uh, of this year, and uh, and if the mood were to lift maybe the next quarter, then perhaps we might see a bigger expansion of this uh, these numbers. Right, uh, uh, Dilip, we've run out of time. Uh, you know, we lost Subir somewhere halfway, and we must, of course, continue that conversation or rather this conversation with him. Uh, and, and touch upon some of the policy challenges in doing all of this. And uh, Subir has argued that, uh, you know, the solutions to these 21st century problems cannot be found in 20th century architecture. So we're going to come back on that and uh, continue our conversation on the India Hangout. Thanks, uh, both of you, and thanks for watching.